Vs, that, Van Vance, and another life. I didn't baby. know you had it in you. <laughs> That's who Terry wants to be when he grows up. <laughs> baby. Serious stuff. There he is, Van oh. Vance, with a little music for tonight. By the way, Jerry David Malloy has also joined us. Jerry, here from what, about 1968 till 1980 or 1966 so, Jerry? 1966 to 1983. 1966 to 83. All right. Long He's, oh. Program director here That's at WHS. another guy I broke in. <laughs> That's right. Vance, Vance, Vance was my hero. Not only that, I got him a place to live next door. To Vance, the Vance yeah. broken everybody in here, and Skip Essick is on the phone from uh, from Michigan. In fact, Skip, I remember the uh, the big blizzard of '94. You didn't, you couldn't call home for what four or five days. Your wife was the only way she could uh, could know you were okay. I guess was to turn on the radio, right? Well, when we got back from when we got back from London, you know, it, it took me more time to get from uh, from. Uh, um, uh, the radio station to my house, like three or four days, <laughs> because yeah. we're stuck down there at the radio station. You couldn't even call home. home. But you couldn't even call home, as I remember, because the lines were so busy. Um, you know, I'm, tr I'm trying to remember that, Joe. I, 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 that part, I don't remember. I, I just know that I was really concerned about uh, uh, what was going on at home, and, and eventually we made, a, we made a stop in the blazer. Uh, we got some milk somewhere mm -hmm. and uh, some junk food, because that's all that was left in town. There was no good food left in Louisville. That's all announcers eat anyway. Food and then going home like Twinkies. I, I made a milk run. You know, here's some Cocoa Krispies, a gallon of milk, and some Twinkies. And good luck to you. <laughs> I hear you. Right. So tell me the Michelle Smith story. Well, what happened uh, when um, uh, Mary uh, Mary Jeffries got a newsroom, and uh, it, it was the uh, th this is a, a young lady that needed a, a kidney transplant and uh, needed to be flown. Um, Boy, I'm trying to remember where it was. I was somewhere Pittsburgh. in Minnesota, I, I believe. Wasn't uh, okay. Go ahead. And uh, the only way that uh, we could get her out of town was uh, uh, some kind of a military lift because the airport was was closed. And so we uh, put a call out on the air. We we managed to get a whole bunch of people to a church parking lot to uh, to shovel the uh, church parking lot. In the meantime, Ron Robertson and uh, Beth Merrill from the news department were riding around in that blazer. Then they went out. And they, they got the gal and her grandmother and uh, and her father and they uh, they transported her to the um, to the church parking lot where uh, where a helicopter picked her up and took her then to uh, uh, to uh, the airport where they had managed to clear uh, the the uh, uh, airport managed to clear a, a, a runway for a military craft to take her to where she needed to go in time for the kidney transplant, and, and she made it in time. She got the kidney. It was, it's amazing that the kidney became available at that time, you know? And, of course, there was, there was only a certain window of opportunity, and, and uh, you had to get there. And, and, uh, and I, th I think that has to be the, whole, the, the big story of the blizzard of 94 mm -hmm. was saving that young girl's life. It was amazing. And, and you know, you, you think about it, I mean, you get emotional thinking about it to this day. Boy, it is. It is an emotional time. Well, you had some great, uh, some great times here, Skip, and we all miss you around here. Hope you come see us again sometime. Let me tell you, if I, I, I look back on that, and it had to be the best job of, that I ever had. And I told I, Skip to walk through the door. It's going to be the easiest job you ever had, Skip. You told me that, Wayne. You were right. And you <laughs> you, but you didn't tell me it would be the best job I ever had. Well, it was, uh, it was a, a great run for you here, and we all enjoyed working for you. And now... Just to bring people up to date, you are the, the radio god of Grand Rapids. We were talking to Bob Shearer here a little bit earlier, but you're running, what, six radio stations for the, the same company, Clear Channel Communications, up in the Grand Rapids area. That's right. It's, it's uh, the same company, so I'm still in the WHAS family, and uh, and the company has six radio stations up here, and uh, and uh, I've got I've got a real good staff of people up here that I uh, get to work with, and uh, we've got a great facility, too. We just built a brand-new facility up here. So uh, the, only, the only thing I, I have to deal with right now is 110 interior decorators. Because everybody thinks they know how to decorate the place. So you can imagine what it looks like. It sounds familiar. It sounds very familiar. Skip, that's a lot of air checks. Do you listen to air checks all day? <laughs> Boy, you know, I can imagine. That Skip, was, Skip was the man who was always listening. He always had the radio on. I, back when, when Skip first got here, I was working all hours of the day and night. And uh, you were always listening. All the time. I still do. I, I listen to you, and I got six other radios up here that I, I have to all these other stations. We went I to church. To to. We went to church for midnight mass at Christmas, and in the middle of, uh, of Handel's Messiah, uh, Skip stands up and says, "Dead air!" You know, he's listening. <laughs> he's, he's got headphones on in church. <laughs> People think that's a joke. See, that's the, <laughs> that's the that's the thing. Skippy, it's always good to talk to you. Thanks for being a part of the show. Good talking to you guys.
Take it easy. Yep. Take Skip care. Essex from, uh, from WOOD and a cast of a thousand other stations up in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan, who is now doing the general manager thing and, and, and doing very well, but was a very important part of this radio station. And, and Rick, he really left you, with, uh, he left you with a full cupboard because he made some changes that uh, I guess were kind of difficult to make at the time, but they, they sure have proven to be... Uh, you know, to, to be good in retrospect here. Well, you're exactly right about that. It, w it was a, 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 a period of uh, significant change for the radio station, and I thought Skip just did a wonderful job bringing all that about. We're going to take a quick break here. We're going to come back after a uh, commentary from El Mezzo on the 75-year anniversary of WHAS Radio. The latest news. We'll talk more with our guests in the studio. Jerry David Malloy from WHAS Radio also joins us, as does the uh, former news director Glenn Baston here in our next segment. We'll relive some of the great moments of WHAS news and a whole lot more with our guests in the studio on 84 WHAS. If you Matt's here. I had always thought that WHAS was one of just a few stations when it went on the air back in 1922. Not true. There were at least 500 stations licensed to operate then, though most didn't last. Even so, there was tremendous excitement about radio, and WHAS particular. Credo Fitch Harris, first manager of WHAS, signed the station on with these words. This is WHAS, the radio telephone broadcasting station of the Courier-Journal and Louisville Times in Louisville, Kentucky. Robert Worth Bingham, who purchased the papers, thought the medium could help the paper circulation and be of good public service as well. You could get a free radio with 12 new six-month subscriptions to the CJ. Early performers, musicians, singers, lecturers were not paid. They apparently just loved being on the air. The first studios were in a fireproof warehouse at 3rd and Liberty. Listening centers were established in the hills and hollers of eastern Kentucky so that those in remote areas could hear the new voice on the air. And yes, they had promotional slogans in those days. My favorite, radio will keep him at home every night. <laughs> I wonder if it did. Since you couldn't hear any other station when WHAS was on, they'd have a silent night each Monday so that local listeners could receive other stations. And what about commercials? In a letter manager Harris wrote to an official in Washington in the 1920s, he said, quote, permitting any sort of advertising over our station is the very last thing we wish to do. My, how times have changed. When WHS joined the newly formed NBC network in 1927, not everyone liked it. One listener wrote, No matter where you turn your dials, about all you get is some confounded high-powered station broadcasting some hot mama jazz selections, grand opera, or some prima donna whose voice sounds like a couple of cats in a serious argument. <laughs> this is Milton Metz, 84 WHAS. This is Kentucky Anna's news, weather, and traffic station. 84 WHAS, News on the hour. It's 11 o'clock. I'm Sandra McQuarrie, News Radio 84 WHAS, Kentucky Anna's news, weather, and traffic station. Depend on it. Welcome back. It's the Joe Elliott Show on 84 WHAS. Tonight, you're invited to a party. It's our 75th anniversary. 84 WHAS Radio, some 75 years ago to the day we signed on the air. And got some uh, some folks in the studio who are helping us celebrate tonight. Wayne Perky, the uh, the longtime morning man on this very radio station, is I here. I was there. I think Reno <laughs> Harris, Marconi, and me and Jerry David. <laughs> all, all in kindergarten together, came up through the ranks. What can I tell you? Rick Belcher from the, uh, the WHAS program director is here. The former program director of WHAS Radio, Jerry David Malloy. And mid-morning sex us. symbol, I might add. And <laughs> mid-morning mid sex symbol. Some the, things never change. I want to tell you Wayne. something. You were talking about Gene Kaler at Mets. One mm -hmm. of the funniest stories that ever happened, one of the funniest things that ever happened on this radio station, Jerry David took a call. He had a, a couple of regulars. One was Charlie, who was really funny, was Jeffy and, and, and Jerry. Yeah. And the other one was the Snuggler. Remember the Snuggler? Oh, yes. Who told the story about Halloween. Oh, uh, great story. And she, great she story. apparently, her husband was watching a basketball game or something on television, right? And she said, honey, I'm going next door for just a minute. Went in the bedroom, took off all her clothes and put on her, a raincoat, right? And mm -hmm. a mask. Raincoat. And went around, out the back door, around the front, rang the front doorbell. He says, I'll be right there. She rings it and rings it and rings it. He finally comes to the door, sort of over his shoulder, watching the ball game. Opens the door and she says, opens her raincoat and says, trick or treat. <laughs> and he slammed the door. <laughs> he said, my wife's not home. <laughs> that door shut. <laughs> a very smart man. 
<laughs> that is a great story. I want to bring in also a gentleman who uh, spent several years here, the longtime news director of WHAS Radio back in the uh, the 1970s. Glenn Baston joins us. Glenn, how are you tonight? Oh, I'm fine, Joe. What a, what a great program. It feels like old home week. Oh, it's we're having a lot of fun down here. I Love wish, Fest here. wish you were with us here. But Glenn, we're glad to... you're still able to uh, walk around and take nourishment. Some <laughs> <laughs> assistance most of the changed, time. Listen, Joe, you were talking earlier about, about Perky coming on the mornings. <laughs> right. This is the Honest to Goodness newsman's objective view. Okay. Jerry David was doing mornings, and he hated it. Yes. Right, Jerry? That is correct. He Mr. hated Best. it. Every morning, Chubar I did would not make it to the big top to be the morning man. <laughs> <laughs> Every morning, I was Chubar afraid of would heights. come in. <laughs> and Jerry David would go in and say to Hugh, I hate it. <laughs> and not more than a minute later, Wayne would go in and say, I'll do it, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how Wayne got to do the morning. <laughs> it's the yin and yang. <laughs> right. I had to take you to lunch three, four, five, six days a week. <laughs> well, you know, there's another guy who had a, who had a, a real uh, significant part in this radio station. Now, let me just tell a quick Hugh Barr story because so many people, they can't believe this when they hear it, but Hugh Barr actually put on a progressive rock and roll show in the middle of the night. You remember this, way? Dave McCree. That's Dave right. McCree. We're remember, playing... Remember, remember the, uh, the big concert back in the big TV studio with Charlie Daniels' band oh, in about yeah. 1971 or two? Is that right? Yes. Yeah, it was... Uh, it made quite an... It was an important part of the history of this radio station when that happened. That's right. Well, <laughs> Hugh Barr was the father of modern WHAS. That's There's right. no doubt. Yep. He, he was the guy who uh, had Jerry David introduce Elton John when nobody was... Aware who really Elton John was. That's exactly who right. David was. <laughs> <laughs> I beg your pardon. I've never been as bent as any. I don't think anybody ever did know who Jerry did. One of the first <laughs> concerts we sponsored was Glenn Campbell, who did the show. He had uh, Jerry Reed and a bunch of guys. This was 1970, mm -hmm. and the round at, at Freedom Hall. And uh, I got to open the show. And the next morning, the guy, I ought to be able to remember that uh, reviewer's name, the television rev radio Howard reviewer. Howard Rosenberg, perhaps? No, it's the guy who preceded him. Okay. Tall, red-haired guy. Uh, I'll never forget him. <laughs> and he said, <laughs> and what the announcer said, here's Glenn Campbell. So I called him up and I said, what do you mean the announcer? Perky, what did I do to offend you? Wayne Perky, P-E-R-K-E-Y, W-H-A-S. Boy, they are just... I was really angry. I bet. They, well, there, there are so many. And, of course, that was the time, like you said, back in those in those days. We, we don't tell the story too much, but you guys were doing anything to draw a crowd. The station's... Please notice me. The, the station's position has improved somewhat, I think it's fair to say. Well, it has, and thank... Well, a lot of guys that you have on there tonight created that, Joe. They caused it to happen. Wayne said something a few years back uh, to me that, that really drove home the point. He said, we all became a family. Mm -hmm. And we did, and I think we reacted as a family amongst ourselves as well as with the community. And that made WHAS work. Well, you know, there's so many things that, that, that we could talk about, and I wish we had a chance to, to spend hours. Unfortunately, we're trying to put 10 pounds of sugar in a 5-pound bag here. Let me, let me move to, uh, to April 1974 and get your memories of, of the coverage of the, the unbelievable uh, tornado that hit Louisville back on uh, Louisville and Brandenburg and lots of surrounding areas, Glenn, in, in April of 1974. Someone earlier tonight said that was a defining moment for the radio station, and, and I think indeed it was. All the talent that we had assembled uh, was, was given the opportunity to perform and to provide a service for the community, and I think indeed it did. Uh, I, I was thinking about this earlier in the day, and I don't remember making a single phone call to a single staff member saying, we need you, but yet every single person drawing a paycheck from WHAS was with, was in the station within a half hour, 45 minutes of that tornado touching down uh, at Freedom Hall. Now, the Brandenburg tornado hit just shortly after 4 o'clock, 4.08, mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. One of the most remarkable moments in radio on this radio station was with the chief announcer, uh, uh, the, I'm sorry, the chief meteorologist at the airport John on the Burr. phone. Yes, mm -hmm. on the air was uh, was Byron yeah. Crawford on? Uh, no, that was Chuck Paddock. Paddock, remember Chuck Paddock? Had yeah. him on the air at the phone, and he's telling him what's going on. And he looked up and he said, "Uh oh, I'm gone." Uh, and dropped he, the phone and dove under the desk. Right? It, well, he was in the he was in the weather service, and he could see the tornado hitting Freedom Hall. And he said, live on the air, "Uh oh, it's here. I'm going." And he hangs up. And boy, what a dramatic moment. 
What a dramatic moment is right. There were so many dramatic moments. Let's listen to one that, that we've heard so much about, but it is still as chilling in 1997 as it was in 1974. Here's Dick Gilbert's description on 84 WHAS. Black low clouds. Uh, let's see. At the moment, they're just about over Bowman Field out at the Taylorsville Road area, and it is swirling around, and uh, it looks like uh, smoke underneath it. There is no real tight, uh, definitive tornado as such. It's still turning in a lot. Yes, there's one now. Started, yes, dipping down from the bottom of the cloud. And uh, let's see, that will be uh, over in the highlands and uh, probably along Bardstown Road and somewhere near Eastern Parkway is where I guess that one is. The power transformers have been blowing regularly in the path of this thing, uh, big, large explosions of blue-white light that uh, helped to uh, clock it pretty well. Now, it's clearing up very nicely behind it. As a matter of fact, uh, just south of Stanford, it's uh, clear. I can see all of the hills. The Iroquois Park area is just about out of it now. But it is definitely uh, moving up toward the Crescent Hill water tank now, and I'm starting to get some strong, very strong gusts way out here on uh, Bardstown Road near the GE plant. That's the way it looks to me. Be very, very careful. Dick Gilbert, Skywatch, 84. Boy, be very, very careful. I mean, you, th that still gives me chills, guys. Me too. Yeah. Oh. Well, Glenn, were you uh, were you anchoring at the time that uh, that Dick was 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 up in the air following that tornado? Uh, I think at that time that uh, that Dick, I, I couldn't hear the piece. I can almost quote it to you from memory. But at the time he did the one, I'm sure you just used the one where you could see the one dipping down. There it is now, dipping down from the clouds. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, that was Byron, Chuck Panic, and myself, and Jeffy Douglas in the studio at that point. And I, I have before me a letter that was written by uh, a lady a couple of days after the tornado that really sums up the work Dick did that afternoon. It says, Dear WHAS and Dick Gilbert, I want to thank the station and especially Dick Gilbert for saving the lives of my son and myself during the tornado. Yeah, I wow. need to say no more. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Boy, it's incredible. What a, what a moment. Jerry, were you, uh, I guess you had gotten off the air, were you still hanging around that day? I was pointing, yes. I was pointing. Yeah. Pointing people in the right direction, yeah. in this direction, in that direction, mm -hmm. which as I think Wayne said, everybody was here, and it, it was just kind of trying to keep some. I kind was of in control. my basement at home, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I was hiding out in my basement. Well, except <laughs> Wayne. <laughs> he was entertaining somewhere. <laughs> he was shaking his hands, shaking hands somewhere. <laughs> that was me and Graham Marshall and a friend That's of mine. Right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but it was it was a very special time, and it was a, another one of those times when you realize what an incredible community we live in. How people came together, how people worked to help one another. The people who were not affected were affected because they were helping the ones who were desperately in need of help. So it was a very magic moment, not only for our radio station, but the community as a whole. You know, we saw that kind of that kind of help and outreach, even with the, with the flood here a few months ago. I, I tell people uh, who, who don't live in Louisville, and they say, you know, what's it like to live in, in Louisville, Kentucky? First thing I mention is the WHAS Crusade for Children, because if you haven't been here and, and been through it and seen it, I mean, you just really don't realize what uh, what unbelievable outreach there is in this community. It's it's something special. That's true. I, I someone made reference to the governor calling Milton uh, mm -hmm. the night of the tornado. Uh, he called the station three times that night. The first time he called, we had had several communications with the governor's office. His press secretary was named Tommy Ford. I was on the air uh, at, at that time, and the the call came in, and they said the governor's office is on the line. I picked up the phone live, and I said. Uh, Tommy, and the boy said, no, this is Wendell. <laughs> <laughs> that was Governor Ford, of course, and he became sort of a reporter for us. So it, it, it went well beyond our staff. Uh, the, the people reacting, of course, Milton took phone calls almost all night long. Mm -hmm. Barney Arnold came in the next morning and found uh, uh, generators so the farmers could get their milking done. And, and it went on for days and days, Joe. It didn't just happen that one afternoon. Well, I think that's the thing. You know, the, that's right. the, the time of the 37 flood to the 97 flood, Wayne, you've had this radio station be there. You're absolutely right. And, uh, Glenn, we, uh, we did the same sort of thing again when the blizzard set. You know, we had yeah. that really heavy snow, and then the blizzard hit the next year. And, uh, 77, we, we, 78. We spent a whole lot of time living in hotels downtown. 
We sure did. Well, the, the night of the tornado, and then for two or three nights thereafter, we slept on the floors in the studios right. down there. Yeah. Wow. 18 minutes after 11, as we go to break, here's more from Dick Gilbert on 84 WHAS. Over uh, Cave Hill Cemetery now. First of all, let me say this. Traffic is at a standstill throughout the city. There are trees all over the pavements. Roads are blocked. I can't even begin to uh, give alternates or tell you uh, specifically which ones are. I've tracked the, the uh, trail of this tornado. It's the first indication I see is out by the Twilight Drive in there by the fairgrounds. Some trailers have been uh, ripped apart at that point. Then it took the roof off of Freedom Hall and the East uh, Pavilion there. It uh, flattened, absolutely destroyed the horse barns at the fairgrounds. It turned over about eight cars on the North-South Expressway. You cannot get, well, one or two cars are trickling through north and southbound on I-65, but it is jammed up northbound and southbound. Then uh, it uh, moved on over just north of Audubon Park. It uh, wiped out a couple of houses. Then into the uh, cemetery at uh, Newburgh and Eastern Parkway, every tree in the cemetery has been uprooted. And Newburgh, at that point, Newburgh, as you approach Eastern Parkway, there are five huge trees laying directly across the road. It's impassable. You cannot get through it. Then there is a more moderate damage moving on over to Eastern Parkway and Bardstown Road. But right below me here, this, this is absolutely, uh, this is as bad as I've seen anywhere. The uh, whole park over here, Seneca uh, Cherokee Park, there aren't any trees left in Cherokee Park. It